for a word. One word from the Lord is enough to turn your life around. Ask the Lord to speak to your heart this morning. He sent his word, his word healed them, his word delivered them from destruction. Father, this morning we ask for the sent word, we ask for the right word, we ask for the word in season. Lord, we ask for the sent word, we ask for the right word, we ask for the word in season. Lord, send us your word, your name be glorified in our midst, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we worship you this morning. On behalf of everyone here, those connected online, Lord, we ask that you have your way in our midst in Jesus' name. Please, you may be seated. Uh, Saturday, the 2nd of March, there will be a housewarming. <laughs> Hallelujah. We'll be celebrating with our brother, Brother Tony and Sister Sandra Douglas for their new home, and the time, the time is 11.30 a.m. to 4 p.m., and the address is 5645 Vintage Cycle, Stockton, uh, California, 95219. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This morning, we'll be looking at part two of what I've been teaching from Wednesday, understanding the responsibility of building your faith. We said that building your faith is a personal responsibility, it's a personal requirement. You build your faith by yourself because it is to you according to your faith. You cannot rely on somebody else's faith, so that's why you need to know what and what you need to put together for your faith to grow. Faith can grow. Where you are today is where your faith st stopped growing. It's where your faith got to. It doesn't matter the challenges of life that are facing you. Your faith can grow and surmount the challenges. So we have a weapon that can grow. And when your faith grows, it can grow above your challenges. That means your challenge will automatically disappear, become non-existent thing. Uh, there are certain things that will be making you, maybe you'll be afraid of. But if your faith grows automatically, you see that you become, in, you get in command. You now begin to dictate. Such things don't make you afraid again. Something has changed about you. Your faith has grown. So that is why the importance that we grow our faith as individuals. You know, there are many, the, the Bible says the world is full of habitation of cruelty. There are many things, challenges of life, you know, and you are not immune to them. They come. But if your faith is standing, you see, Jesus Christ, when he pray, prayed for Peter, in Matthew chapter 18, he said, no. He said, Satan desire to sift you. It's the desire of devil to sift any one of us. But he said, I have prayed that your faith fails not. Is the desire of prayer that, you, you, that the devil doesn't tempt you? No. He said, I have prayed that your faith fails not. Because that temptation will come. But the issue is that will your faith stand? Because faith failure is heart failure. When your faith fails, everything about you is spiritual fails. Because the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if your faith is not standing, God will not be in your equation. Because any transaction you must contact with God must be on the basis of faith. So that is why faith is a very important weapon. It's a lifestyle of a believer because the Bible says that just shall live by their faith. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38. That just has no other life but to live the life of faith. So your faith must stand as a Christian. So no matter what you do, your faith must stand. Because when your faith stands, there is nothing the situation can do to you. There is nothing the challenge can do to you because your faith will always overcome. That is faith. So we now began to look at the roots of a growing faith and the importance, the things that we need to do, the ingredients of, a, of faith that will make our faith to grow. We looked at a number of them, and this morning will be continuing part two. Understanding your responsibility. 
of building your faith. Number one, this money is that God must be your only source of expectation. God must be your only source of expectation. You see, faith must be absolute in God. Faith must be complete in God. So God must be your only source of expectation. That means whatever God cannot do, let it not be done. Absolutely. Wherever God cannot take me, may I never get there. So your faith must be absolute dependent on God. Psalm 62 verse 5 and verse 6, God must be your only source of expectation. The psalmist said, I say, my soul, wait patiently, wait silently for God alone. Wait silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him, not from any other source. He said, wait silently. Remain, wait, wait for him. Even though he tarry, he said, wait, wait. My soul, wait. Because my expectation will only come from God, not from man. You see, many times you are looking up to man, you claim that you are looking up to God. No. There must not be an alternative to God if your faith must work. It must be absolute. God must be your only source of expectation. That means you are looking up to him because the Bible said they looked up to him. They were never put to shame. There is nobody that has ever centered his focus on God that was ever met with shame. He said, but they looked up to him. Their faces were lightened. That means they saw what they were looking for. Their expectation was not cut short. And they were not put to shame. My soul wait silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. That the situation won't even move me. The challenges won't even move me. It doesn't matter the circumstances around. He say, I shall not be moved. He say, him only is my rock and my salvation. Is God your only source of hope? Is God your only source of expectation? Now, I want you to look at that challenge in your life. Ask yourself, is God and my focus on God as the only rock and my salvation? Is there a way out you are looking out for? Are you saying, oh, I've waited for God, uh, let me try something else? Ask yourself, just look at that challenge of life now that is confronting you, where you are seated now. Ask yourself, do I have alternative to God? Is there any other thing? I'm hoping. I remember one time my wife had a friend back then in Nigeria, you know, this uh, polygamous family and polygamous battles. So the girl happened to be from a polygamous family. So at times she communicates with my wife. So my wife encourages her. And I, you know, communicate with my wife. The battles, the wife is you know, engaging with the other concubines and all that and all that. So my wife will keep on encouraging her and encouraging her. I say, okay, do you pray? You tell your mother to pray and all those other that. So a time came, the, my wife told the lady, the lady said, eh, my mother said, God's own, they take time. Say, make I try something else. You see, so she began to go to diabolic, you know, so, so he said, God's, God's own, God's method. <laughs> you may be here, you, you are, there is something that you are believing God for. It may seem as if he's taking time. But may I assure you this morning that God is the only right source. Who is able to do? You see, let me tell you. You see, the thing that Devil, devil can give you what God can give you. Eh? 
but his own is not without repercussions. If you need riches today, wealth, and you want to go to the ways of the devil, he can offer you wealth. But the Bible says it's only the blessings of God that makes rich and add no sorrow. So the woman said, God's, God's, God's own, God's ways. That is why the Bible said, it said, my soul waits silently. For he is my only source of expectation. He is my only rock and salvation. So wait. So don't be weary in waiting for the Lord. He said, I will not be moved, irrespective of the challenges. He, for he is my only rock and my salvation. He is my defense, I shall not be moved. See, you cannot make uh, one of your eyes to be looking up while the other one is looking down. It's not possible. One eye looking up, then the other one looking down. No. So when you are looking up to man, don't claim that you are looking up to God. When you are looking up to man, don't claim that you are looking up to God. So your faith must be absolute. Absolute. My expectation will only come from God. So it's God that I'm looking for. It's God that is my only source. Don't have alternative. If God cannot do it, may he remain undone. Where God cannot take me, may I never get there. Absolute. Psalm 121 verse 1 to 3. He said, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where comes my help? He said, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Where is your eyes lifted up? Where is your expectation coming from? He said, even though I lift up my eyes to the hills, where will come my help? He said, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your feet to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. He does not sleep nor slumber. You may lose as if the, 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 the streams of life, the seas of life are charging at you. But just know that your keeper, your defender does not sleep nor slumber. You know, there are times that challenges will overwhelm you. you. You'll be asking, God, where are you? God is right there. Oh, God, where are you? Has people asked you, where is your God? What they are saying, call him to action. Where is your God? I thought you were a Christian. We have been praying. Where is your God, that God that you are calling on? I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? He said, I will not take help from any other source. Though there may be other sources of help, I will not take help from any other source except from the Lord that made heaven and earth. Because that is the only sure help. There is no help you get from any other source. There is no gift that devil gives for free. Devil has no free gift. No. One day in my place, they said the, the, the business of devil is trade by butter. Bring this one and take this one. Bring this one. There is no free gift with the devil. As the devil give me money now, he might say, Okay, bring your womb, bring your manhood. 
might say, bring your mother, bring your father. It's just a change. But the blessing of the Lord makes rich and add no sorrow. You are looking for a child now. Devil can give you a child and see, take something else from you. Say, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. In James chapter 1 from verse 5, he said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach. And he will give him. He said, but let him ask in faith, ask in faith, with no doubting. Ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. The person that doubts, he said, if you need anything, God is able to supply. But ask in faith. Ask in faith, believing that he will do what you are asking him. Not doubting. He said, the person that doubts, it's like the wave of the sea. It moves everywhere that the wind blows. Everywhere. He has many alternatives, many options. His, his heart is not set on the Lord of heaven. Uh, uh, this thing, why not try this? He runs to that direction. Uh, why not try this? He says, uh, oh, yeah. This thing can walk through this way. He walks there. He rushes to that direction. Trying many other things. He said, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed about by the wind. You know wave of the sea. You know, like, ooh, 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 ooh. Anywhere the wind blows, the wave, he just, anywhere, is not settled. He said, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You can't put hope in God and in something else together. You can't put hope in God and hope in something else. Together. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord because he's double minded. He's double minded. Eh? Eh? No. Will he, will he walk? He will not walk. Eh? Will God do it? God will not do it. Now, give me Romans chapter 4, verse 19. You see, when we talk about Abraham, the Bible tells us that Abraham was not weak in faith. Not being weak in faith. He did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. Now the deadness of Sarah's womb, can you give 20 to 21? He said he did not waver. Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. He did not waver. He was not shaky. Just what James chapter 1 is telling us. Abraham looked at the promise of God. He said, yeah, God has a promise here for me. I am standing there. He didn't waver. At the promise of God. Will God, will he not? Will, is God able? Will he do? No, will he not? The Bible says he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. He hasn't received, but he was giving glory because he had the substance of faith with him evidence of something that he hoped for. He had with him. So he did not waver. Had a promise. God has a promise for you. 
He's a covenant keeping God. Has he said it? Will he not do it? So he was threatened in faith. I'm being fully convinced that what he had promised him, he was able to perform. So there was a settlement in his heart that God has promised me. He is able to perform what he, he was convinced. You see, so you need to have this kind of conviction. He was convinced that God has spoken to me concerning my generation being more than the sand by the seashore. So he was not wavering at the promise of God. So he stood at the promise of God. For Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. He said, for God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Diligently. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. For him who comes to God must believe that he is. You must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them. Not, not them that seek him anyhow. Diligence. Diligently. They that seek him diligently. So, there must be diligence in your seeking of God. There must be a resolution in your heart when you are seeking the Lord. He said, let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. Because he's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. Because God is a rewarder of them that are diligent. That's why the Bible tells us that Abraham did not weather at the promise of God. Through unbelief. He was strengthened in faith. He was not shaky, shaky. That's what James is telling us. That that man who doubts is like the wave, the wave of the sea that, that you know, is being tossed about by every wind. That blows. You see, your faith is rooted in God, we never fail. Faith can never fail. Absolute faith in God can never, it must deliver. It must deliver. It may take time, but it must deliver. Second Chronicles chapter 16. From verse 7. And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, the king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hands. He had an alternative. He said, the seer came, he told us, he said, you have relied not on God. So you are relying, your faith is not on God, you have relied on the king. Oh, Allah of Syria and not on God. I don't know where your reliance is. I don't know where your hope is. The expectation, the thing that you are believing God for or the thing that you, are, you want done in your life. Where are you relying? Where are you relying? And then he began to make reference He said, we are the Ethiopian and the Lubim, not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen. Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hands. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. He said, when the time you relied on the Lord, you defeated a mighty army. Now, what is it now that you cannot rely on the Lord? 
that you are not rely on the king of Syria. He said, we are the Ethiopian and the Lubim, not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen. But because you relied on God, God delivered them to you. Now, you see, that is why it's very good to be a good student of history. You need to document certain things in your life. Certain hands of God. Encounters that you have had with the Lord. Very good. You must have a book where you enter things that God has done, the, the visible hands of God that you witness. Because in the day you are challenged, you're going to make reference to them. That is how you know the mightiness of God. But if you don't know, you forget so soon. Any a little challenge, you might just veer off. But when you have this, you say, ah, God that healed me of cancer can heal me of headache now. Uh -uh. You see, you have evidence, you have encounter. Now, the, the, the prophet began to refer to it. He said, look at it. When you relied on God, you defeated the whole army of Ethiopia and Lubim. But now, you are not relying on an ordinary man. He said, they have escaped in your hand. And then he now made a warm pronouncement to him. He said, you have done foolish. In this, you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. So it's foolishness not to rely completely on the Lord. It's foolishness to put your hope on a man. But he said, but the Lord, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal. You know what loyalty means? It's not conditional. When you're loyal to somebody, that means no matter what comes, you are there. You are loyal to that person. Your heart is, he said, God's eye is running. Trying to locate those whose hearts are loyal to him. Not everybody. Whose hearts are loyal to him. To show himself strong on their behalf. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. The Bible tells us they say no man, no one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So when your hope, your expectation is in something else, never claim that you are looking up to God. Never claim. They are looking up to God. Number two, we must beware of serving other gods. We must beware of serving other gods. Serving other gods. We must beware of serving other gods. You see, when most of the time when we talk about serving other gods, all your mind goes is to idol worshippers. People that bow down before an effigy or carved image. But so many of us are idol worshippers. Idol worshippers. It's not until you bow down to an image that you are serving other gods. The Bible tells us, it says, where a man's treasure is, there is his heart. Where is your heart? Is your heart set on the Lord? Is your heart set on your job? Is your heart set on your marriage, on your children? Where is your heart?
In Exodus chapter 20 from verse 4. He said, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters underneath the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. God said, I'm a jealous God. You can't serve me and serve any other thing. If you are for me, be for me. If you are not for me, you are against me. You shall not serve any other God. Anything that takes priority in your life before God is an idol. Is an idol. I mean, I tell you this morning, what God does to idol is that he destroys idols. God destroys idols. God cannot align with idols. No. Remember when they hijacked the Ark of Covenant? When the Philistines kidnapped the Ark of Covenant? They went to keep the Ark in the house of their God, Dagon. God said, no. I can't stay in the same place with an idol. By the time they came out more in the morning, God has dealt a damage to Dagon. Dagon. Anything that becomes an idol, God will fight. Are you hearing me? Anything that becomes an idol, God will fight. God destroys idol. He fights idol. He says, I am a jealous God. I am a jealous God. If your finances becomes an idol, God will begin to fight. That is why you won't know how your finances will crumble. Anything that you lift above God, God will try to pull it down. And that's why when you see this thing happening to some people, you won't identify it's the hand of God. No, because when you begin to give God's position to something else, you make that thing an enemy of God. That thing becomes an idol. And then what God does to idol is that he destroys idol. He fights idol. And you begin to fight that thing. It may be anything you like. God destroys idols. So you can't put God side by side with an idol. Say, you shall not have any other God besides me. You shall not. In Psalm 16, verse 4, Psalm 16, verse 4, he said, Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after other gods. Their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer and not take upon their names on my lips. He said they multiply their sorrow. When you have an idol, what you are doing is you are multiplying your sorrow. Your sorrow increases. When you put your hope in anything that is not God, you are only trying to cause a heart attack for yourself. Your sorrow. Your sorrow will multiply. They that seek after other gods only end up multiplying their sorrows. They multiply their sorrows. When you go to seek from the devil what God can give you, you only end up multiplying your sorrow. You end up multiplying your sorrow. It's only God's gift that has no sorrow addition. Anything that the devil gives you, adds sorrow to it. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's only the blessings of God that will make you rich without sorrow. Anything you go to get from the devil, he, the, the addition is sorrow. That is the bonus. The bonus he will add to it is sorrow. So 
So they that hasten after other gods, multiply theirs. May nothing push you away from the God of heaven. May nothing be too urgent that you cannot wait for God to answer. May you never found in such situation where you can't wait for God to answer you. And you hasten after other God. He say you multiply your soul. The word of God. I've, I've seen people that got rich. I mean rich. They got rich but not, not by right way. But before you know, the, the wealth will disappear. You see, if devil gives you wealth, either you die and leave the wealth or the, left, the wealth will leave you before you die. If devil gives you money, either you die, leave the money for people you don't know, or the money will leave you before you die. Number three. We must be aware of an evil conscience. Evil conscience. Evil conscience. You cannot build your faith on evil conscience. Bad conscience. Acts chapter 24 verse 16. This being so, he said, I myself always strive. To have a conscience without offense towards God and men. Towards God and men. Not just only towards God. Towards God and men. To have a conscience without offense. Faith suffers a shipwreck without a good conscience. Faith suffers a shipwreck without a good conscience. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. So your faith cannot work when your conscience is wrong. Now, faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected. Concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. You tell some people, they tell you it doesn't matter. They have a dead conscience. They are sitting on people, but they are believing God for their own lifting. They are dealing evil with people, but they are believing God for expansion. Dead conscience. He says some have rejected putting their faith with good conscience and they have suffered a shipwreck of their faith. Without a pure conscience, faith cannot deliver. Without a pure conscience, faith cannot deliver. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 9. Without a pure conscience, your faith will fail. Holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. Holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. Faith is a mystery. You are holding it with a pure conscience. So you must make sure that your conscience is pure. Your conscience is good. Not just towards God, but towards your fellow man. Look at your relationship with your husband. Look at your relationship with your colleagues. You must make sure for your faith to work that your conscience is clean and pure. Not carrying evil conscience and praying. And believe in God. They say you, your faith will suffer a shipwreck. Because you must hold the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. He says some have rejected. They, you tell them, they say it doesn't matter. Eh? Eh, God will do it. But your, your conscience is dead, wicked, very bad conscience. He said they rejected good conscience with faith. 
and they suffer the shipwreck. They suffer the shipwreck of their faith. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. Now, unforgiveness can make your faith of no consequence. Unforgiveness. Carrying somebody in your mind. No, I will never forgive them. I will never forgive them. What they did to me. The evil they cost me. The harm they cost me. I will never let go. Even if I leave every other thing, I will never leave them. You are carrying them. Somebody said unforgiveness is like eating poison and expecting another person to die. You are the one eating the poison. And you are expecting somebody else to die. It damages you and not the person you are holding in your heart. Unforgiveness. It can hinder your faith. I remember a testimony of one powerful woman of God was dying, dying of cancer. All kinds of prayer, people have prayed and they prayed and every until one man of God came and God ministered to him. He said, why all this prayer we are praying for this woman, your daughter is not being healed. He said, ask her, unforgiveness. And the man said, excuse me, ma. Is there anybody you are carrying in your heart? He said, no. He said, such well. Is there anybody you are carrying in your heart? Before she now confessed. Either he was the father or stepfather that violated her when she was young. And she has been holding this man in the heart. Unforgiveness. And then she was able to let go. And cancer died. I've heard some people say, I don't know whether it's scientifically proven, that bitterness of the heart is what causes cancer. If you are bitter, you have offenses in your heart. That is one of, this, one of the things that strengthens cancer cells in somebody. You know, they are abnormal cells. That what feeds them offense. So be careful when you are carrying people in your heart. Is it, is it, you are the one carrying the load. The pain of the load is on you, not on them. And it's very dangerous because you might be carrying somebody in the heart. That person doesn't even know. The person is rejoicing, greeting you. Hey, say, hey sister, hi. And your heart is born. Mm. Mm. And the person says, say, hi, brother, hi. How are you doing today? And your heart. Even to answer greeting, you will not. You are carrying heavy load. The person is not feeling it. It's like you are eating poison, you are expecting another person to die. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. He said, Husbands, likewise dwell with dwell with them with understanding. Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So your prayer can be hindered by your relationship with your husband. Your relationship with your spouse can be a hindrance to your prayer. Can hinder your prayer. So you must make sure that your conscience is clear. You must make sure you have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards man. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Now, there's something that surprises me about this place. 
Matthew chapter 5. He said, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you. Now, you see, he said, when you now remember your brother, your brother is not happy. Not that you are not happy with your brother. You see, that, that is the thing that surprises me here. He said, and you remember that your brother is not happy against you. Eh? Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, he said, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now, you see, when you understand this scripture, you now find out how many offerings that we offer that we are not acceptable. It will surprise you. And they tell you, uh, just bring any kind of bring. God accepts God. Who told you God accepts every kind of offering? Now, it's the same God that is telling you now, if you bring offering, no matter how many billion dollars you are bringing, and you discover that somebody is not happy. Now, now go and say, it's not that you are not happy with the person. The person is not happy. You go and say, brother, brother, is there anything that we have to settle? Sister, uh, my wife, please, is there any quarrel? We, is, how, why, why was your face squeezing? Is there anything I did you didn't like? Are you getting what the Bible is saying? Not that you are not happy or you have something against the person or they did you something. No. They have something against you. You might not know what they have against you. You say, drop, go and find out first and be reconciled. Let that person be smiling for you. Let that person be happy for you before you come and offer your offering. But these days, what do we preach? Anywhere you gather, even if you kill somebody, bring the tithe, bring the offering. If you're 419, bring the tithe, bring the offering. Now, we forgot about the ordinances of God, what makes the offering acceptable to God, that the God that we are giving is not a beggar. He's not a beggar. I said, ah, ah. So God said, offering. Ah, ah. Pastor said, bring, 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 bring offering. Whether it's ripe or it's not ripe, bring. Ah, church needs money. But God is telling you, if you bring, please, hold on. If you want me to accept, go and amend, have amendment. Go and reconcile first. Then you come and bring your offering. So God is not in a hurry to accept. But the pastor is in a hurry. Yes, pastor is in a hurry. Bring it. Bring it. Put it in offering basket, then go and be settling. Because by the time you go and come back, you may change your mind. <laughs> so bring, bring. You see the Bible? So more now you can see the voluminous of the offerings that we give that God doesn't accept. And at times we'll be asking, ah, why are, is our blessings not returning back to us? Why are we not blessed? We are givers. We are titers. We are doing this. We are doing that. Why is the blessing not coming as the Bible requested? As the God has promised us in his words. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1 to 2. He said, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So your conscience matters if it comes to the things of faith. Don't be among those that say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's God. I'm, it's me, me and God, one on one with God. There's some people who tell you, no, it's personal thing. I have God. That one you're talking is your own. Uh, no, let me finish with God first. So I'm dealing with God. It's God that I'm dealing with. Your, your, this thing doesn't matter. 
However you feel or whatever you do, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, it's God. He said, have conscience void of offense towards God and towards your fellow man. Towards God and then towards your fellow man. Void of offense for your faith to walk. Number four. One must keep the joy of the Lord alive in him or her. Joy. Joy. Very important. One must keep joy alive. See, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 4, Abraham was able to give glory to God because he retained the joy of the Lord. Because when joy dies, every other thing dies. When joy dies, nothing produces. So no matter the condition, Abraham's situation was hopeless. But he tried, he sustained his joy. And that was why he was able to. You see, it takes a joyful heart to give glory. It takes a joyful heart to sing melody. It takes a joyful heart to give glory to God. If your heart is not joyful, do you know the kind of thing that will be coming from it? Curses. You'll be cursing anybody you see. But if your heart is joyful, you, you, all of a sudden, songs melodies to be coming out from you. So, your joy is very, very important. We stop here today. I want you to rise to your feet. So, if our faith must work, we need all these ingredients. We need all these things to put together for our faith not to fail. Maybe you have seen yourself in one or two of them. And say, oh, this could be the reason why my faith is not working. This could be the reason why it's, um, it's like I'm making empty confession. This should be the reason why it's like the doors are locked out against me. I want you to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Ask the Lord for mercy. Ask the Lord for mercy. Look at your dealing with your husband, with your spouse. Look at your dealing with your colleagues, with your children. Ask God for mercy this morning. 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 Ask him for forgiveness. Oh, any hindrance of faith? Faith will not fail. But if any of these things fails, we'll make a shipwreck of our faith. Let's ask God. Let's ask him to touch us this morning. Let's ask God to release his mercy to us this morning. That our faith will begin to walk like the faith of the Bible people. That our faith will begin to walk like the faith of our uh, fathers in faith. Ask God to clean your conscience. Plead the blood of Jesus Christ. This morning, your conscience, plead his blood. The blood is able to cleanse us from every sin, every unrighteousness. Plead the blood of Jesus Christ this morning. Plead the blood of Jesus Christ this morning. Father, we come to you, ancient of days. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word that has come to us this morning. Lord, we, are, we fall on our faces, Lord. We ask for your mercy this morning. Let your mercy, Lord, avail for us. In every area we are found wanting by your word that has come to us this morning. Lord, touch us with your mercy. Touch us with your mercy. Touch us with your mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing. Thank you for restoration. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, before I come down, let's, uh, let me have those that uh, today is...